I'm Shirley Fiesme, and on this episode of Voice for the Voiceless, we examine domestic violence and hear victim stories of survival and how they empower themselves through the experience. According to the CDC, in the United States, an average of 20 people experience intimate partner physical violence every minute. This equates to more than 10 million abuse victims annually. One in three women and one in four men experience some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. One in seven women and one in 18 men are severely injured by an intimate partner. One in five women and one in 59 men in the United States is raped during his or her lifetime. In an effort to reach out and educate its student population, Montgomery College regularly invites guest speakers to speak on this sensitive issue. In this excerpt, we hear from Ms. Mildred Muhammad, the DC sniper's former wife, who shares her harrowing story of survival. See, the victim and the abuser have a dialogue that only those two people understand. He already told me, you have become my enemy, and as my enemy, I will kill you. So I have two choices. I could go back to him and die, or never see my children again. I hung up the phone and I let out a scream. The nurses came, they said, what's the matter? I said, can you trace the call? They traced the call to a woman who called the hospital for John. My mother called shortly thereafter and said, John just called her, said he's on his way to the hospital to kill my daughter. So they took me out of one room, put me in another room, took my name off of the register, posted a guard outside my door. Anybody that was coming up to see me needed to send up their ID so that I can identify who they were because they had no idea what John looked like. A social worker came up, she said, Miss Muhammad, you can't go home. I said, what do you mean I can't go home? My mom is there. He said, we'll take care of your mother, but we need you to do three things. We need for you to change your clothes. We're gonna bring you a change in the clothes. You can't dress like that anymore. You need to change your name. Change it to a name that when someone calls you, you will respond. So my safe name is Millie. And the third thing, which is the hardest thing, you have to disconnect from everybody that you know. Nobody can know where you are, because we have to put you in hiding. This man is going to kill you. Can you do that? Do I have a choice? No. OK. So we waited until it got dark. They brought me the clothes, took me out the back of the hospital to a car. I had to slouch down in the front seat. I checked the rooftops. I checked the open windows because, see, I knew that it was going to be a headshot because John's motto was one shot, one kill to the head, never leave an enemy behind. They drove me all over the place when actually took me right across the street to a shelter. I get to the shelter, the staff person say, Millie, you're in luck. You have your own room. Like, I'm gonna be in the shelter. So, go into the shelter, go in the room. I sit on the bed and think, what am I doing here? I have my own business. Taking care of my mother, my children. Why am I here? I'm a businesswoman. Why am I here? In order to take steps towards preventing domestic violence, experts suggest that it's important to identify the different forms of domestic abuse that are commonly encountered. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological or emotional abuse, financial abuse, or financial exploitation. In this next excerpt, Ms. Tova Kasten, director of the Elder Safe Center, clearly illustrates these type of abuse. A lot of people will say, even though physical sounds like you'd be hurt the worst, a lot of people say it's the psychological abuse that's actually the hardest to take because someone who purports to love you is actually psychologically causing damage to you, and that can be very traumatizing. That could make you feel like you might not be able to do something that you want to do again, feel good about yourself. So it's very, very important to recognize that. Oftentimes, children are used in the power and control relationship for the abuser to keep power over the person that he's abusing, OK? So I think you had a speaker the other day that talked about, you know, power and control, the power and control wheel, how that works. So the only way domestic violence can work is if someone has an imbalance of power 
over the other person. It's a pattern of abusive behavior where one person has way more power than the other. Suppose you're a woman who is being abused and you have two children and your abuser is saying to you, if you ever try to leave me, I'm going to take those children and you're never going to see them again. That happens all the time. So if someone says that they're going to take your children from you and you'll never see them, you'll never see your children again, how do you think you're going to feel? I'm a mom of two boys. If someone threatened to take my children, I think I would be paralyzed. I think I would be unable to move for fear that something would happen to them. That's how a lot of women feel in abusive relationships because the abuser knows. How is he maintaining all the power, right? Now he's bringing the kids into it. So it's not just about him hitting or calling you names or sexually abusing you. It's now saying, turning the children and saying, listen, you make one move and that's it. You may not see your children again. And I've worked on the cases where abusers have abducted, which means taken the children without permission to another country, to another state. And sometimes it is very difficult legally to try to get someone back because there's a lot of complicated laws and not every state and not every country. I mean, in the states you can, in the country, some countries don't recognize that they need to return the children. And sometimes in the state, the abuser might go and file an order and make up a story that makes it look like she's the one harming them. And so the court may not understand what the true story is. So this is real life. This, this happens every day. There's another kind of abuse which is really common. And I see it a lot. Right now, I work with older adults who are being abused. And it's called financial abuse, OK? or financial exploitation. Suppose you are charged with doing a certain thing. And I'd like to use the example that you did of like you're the granddaughter and you're helping grandma. But you're only supposed to help grandma, let's say, pay the bills, pay the electricity, pay for food. But grandma, let's say, has $10,000 in her account. Maybe she's getting some government subsidies. Maybe this is hard-earned money she's earned over the years. And all of a sudden, you say, you know, I really need a new car. I really could, uh, I'll pay her back eventually. I'm just going to take $5,000 out of that account and buy myself a car because I really need to get to school. Are you allowed to do that? No. no. OK. So you've overstepped your limits with that relationship. That happens a lot with older adults who may not be able to um, keep track of their checkbooks as much, or they're relying on you, and they love you, and they trust you, and then you misuse that trust, OK? It also happens in relationships um, that are in uh, the younger generation. Maybe you're dating, or you're married to someone. And I see this a lot, even when the victim is working, and she won't see a penny of her paycheck. He monitors that money. It goes in an account. And she's not allowed to take money out. A lot of times, the abusers will count the change. If you go to the store, won't let you buy new clothes for yourself or for your kids. And this is more than just couples negotiating the boundaries of what you know their budget is. This is about not having control over money. And if you don't have control over your money and you're being abused, what do you think is going to happen? So if someone financially controls your situation, that is also very problematic, OK? So do you think all of these different types of abuses happen separate from one another? Or do you think sometimes they can happen together? So there's a word for that. It's called co-occurring. Co-occurring. That means that someone might be financially abusing you and physically abusing you and or emotionally abusing you, and sometimes all of the above sexually abusing you, this can happen. So it's not just one or the other. Sometimes it happens all at once, and that's called co-occurring. So if you are in a situation where you're experiencing multiple forms of abuse over a long period of time, we said it before, you might feel worthless. You might not feel good about yourself because your abuser is calling you names. Your abuser is frightening you. Your abuser might be threatening to take your kids or hurt your family members. And then on top of it all, 
If you're from perhaps another country or you have limited language accessibility, you may not know what resources to turn to in here in Maryland or the United States, and you might not even know it's a crime, because in some nations it's not a crime. So you're further isolated because you may be in a new environment, or you might be living with relatives and you might not want to stir the pot. So this can be really complicated. Both men and women can be victims of domestic violence. But overwhelmingly, women tend to be the victims of their male intimate partners. In this next clip, Professor Dr. Esther Schwartz McKenzie looks at domestic violence in China, a country which has taken unprecedented strides forward in economic development in the past two decades, but has fallen behind on enforcing some of the most basic human rights. Okay, so let's do big picture first. Worldwide, one in three women suffers physical or sexual violence. This is an epidemic. Now, we are making progress. In 1995, 13 out of 100 countries had laws against domestic violence. But now, that number is closer to 76 out of 100. Enforcement is really difficult, and change takes time. And many, many women are still at risk. The thing is that in these countries, change is slow because too often violence has been normalized. It's seen as an ordinary part of intimate relationships, especially in marriage. Now, over the past four decades, a spotlight has been on China. Um, we have known during this time that um, domestic violence is a serious human rights issue. And the Chinese government does not like being told what to do, but also wants the world's good opinion. And one of the things that you'll see as this talk progresses is how ag activists have managed to leverage that. Surveys suggest that up to 40% of women in China suffer domestic violence. And this is believed to be even a higher percentage in rural areas. Now, the thing is that over the past 20 years, this rate has been increasing. In fact, it's increased by over 25%. So America still has a problem, certainly. But our trend has been downward since 1994, which is when the Violence Against Women Act was first authorized. So think about this. China has a population of over 3 billion, 371 million people. However, there are only 500, or I'm sorry, 50,000 reports of violence registered annually. So this is not something that people are seeking help for. These are some of the factors that perpetuate violence against women. Men are rarely prosecuted. Police usually refuse to intervene. Battering is not usually acknowledged as a grounds for divorce. And many people believe that spousal abuse is justified um, in many cases, um, particularly when women do things like refuse sex or burn the food or, or speak up and argue. Now, these factors are really cementing. In America, we have marital property laws. That means that when a married couple is divorcing, the property, um, value, the, the property that's owned, um, both partners have a right to that um, income from that property. But in China, there aren't marital, marital property laws. And in fact, women's property ownership has been decreasing. Home ownership by law and by custom is usually male. Also, there are really few support structures for victims of domestic violence. Um, so think about it. If women don't own the property, if only husbands own the home, the ground beneath a battered woman's feet is literally not secure. And without a shelter to go to, there's no safe space. This really illustrates for us how power at its core is very much about economics. 
Here in the United States, we also blame victims. She deserved it. She was asking for it. This is a strategy for silencing that is very powerful. However, in China, that culture of silence is being newly challenged by social media, which has produced global and domestic forums for exchange, support, activism, and discussion. There are two stories, two events that happened relatively close to each other. This is history in the making. This is something that's happening, ongoing right now. There are two very high profile stories of battered women in China which have stoked a movement. The first one is a woman named Li Yan. Um, she's a rural woman from the Sichuan province in China. And the other is Kim Lee. She is the American wife of a Chinese celebrity. He's the founder of an English language learning program um, called Crazy English. Li Yan suffered incredible abuse over many years. She repeatedly tried to get help. She was um, beaten so badly that she had numerous hospital admissions for cigarette burns. Um, at one point, her husband cut off one of her fingers. She was being terrorized. And everywhere she went, she talked to people in the health field, she talked to neighbors, she talked to family, and everyone told her, go back home. Make it nice. Make up with your husband. Show him you're a good wife. Finally, during a particularly brutal beating, she fought back and she killed him. And she was immediately sentenced to execution without reprieve. Now, this was something that um, activists found out about. And they, were, they launched such, such a successful media campaign that her death sentence was overturned. Now, this is unheard of because in America, we have this idea that self-defense in a case like this is a, considered, a factor to be considered. But in China, self-defense in a case of domestic violence was not something that could be considered. So her death sentence was overturned. She is now serving life in prison. This is considered a victory. Now, here's the story of Kim Lee, and this is a very different story. Kim Lee was also a victim of ab abuse. And she um, not only went repeatedly to the police and to the hospital and to other places for help, but when she realized that that wasn't happening, when she realized that the police were intentionally losing her reports, when she got told to be a good girl and go back to her husband, she decided to post images of her injuries on Weibo, which is China's equivalent of Twitter. And before they could be taken down, those images went viral. This couldn't be ignored. Um, in the end, she was granted a divorce, which again, domestic violence was not a grounds for divorce at this time, so that was very unusual and very striking. She also was given compensation. This was the first time that domestic violence was discussed openly on the state-run China Central Television, and it was also the very first time that a restraining order was issued in China. This is one of the pictures that she posted on Weibo. And this is Kim Lee now. She has become an activist against domestic violence. So those two events help to stoke a movement. Um, you can see here that these young women are dressed in bridal dresses, spattered with blood. And the posters read, only equality is harmonious. When violence is around, are you still silent? And by the way, one of these activists did end up in jail for a subsequent act of defiance. Um, here is a 2014 billboard in Beijing about putting a stop to domestic violence. 
So you can see that there's energy behind the movement. Montgomery College is committed to helping prevent domestic violence and support those affected by it. This is achieved by creating and enhancing partnerships with local organizations, as seen on this video. Montgomery College initiated a formal partnership with the Montgomery County Family Justice Center, a collaboration of public and private county agencies providing services to families impacted by domestic violence. At the Family Justice Center, we're always looking for different community partnerships that make sense for our mission. The collaboration with Montgomery College originated through conversations with Dr. David Sears, and he opened up a, a really generous program for this tuition assistance. We're going to provide scholarships, both in credit and non-credit programs, to allow those clients to take advantage of the education offerings that we have. The college is also offered to pick up the tab for their books and provide them a guidance counselor to help them navigate through the educational system of the college. Combining the strengths of the two organizations will be a big boost to the future prospects of domestic violence victims while enhancing MC's community outreach efforts. We are interested in promoting not only safety but self-sufficiency for our clients here. We know that financial barriers can be a big issue for somebody who's trying to break out of an abusive relationship. The benefit that the college gets is basically another opportunity to reach out to the most underserved and underprivileged people in the community. It's an opportunity for us to educate them, create a better workforce for the county and for the college. Both Montgomery College and the Family Justice Center see great things for the future of their collaboration. I see for the future of this partnership that will make the partnership even stronger by combining efforts with the nonprofits that are involved with the Family Justice Center and being able to reach out to even more um, diverse and underserved populations in this county. In the past, we've been able to collaborate with uh, University of Maryland students as interns, and right now we're working on a program to get Montgomery College interns in as well. And I think it would be mutually beneficial for both the student interns and for the staff here. We really, really are grateful for our interns. Doing community engagement is fabulous work. It's meaningful work. And in the end, we're going to see some great impact on the Family Justice Center clients with this partnership. If you yourself are a victim of domestic violence or know anyone who might be, here are some organizations that offer counsel and guidance at the local and national levels. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.